So when I was at Strange Loop, I attended several coding dojos, and uh, there were different problems, but uh, one problem that uh, the group had a little trouble with was a uh, Minesweeper challenge. So I want to show it to you. Uh, it's fairly straightforward. You give it a data structure, like we have on the left, it, when it uh, represents a game of Minesweeper, uh, which where blank cells are represented by spaces, and cells with bonds are represented by X's. You want to produce the data structure on the right, which is a list of counts of bonds surrounding a given cell, or minus one if the cell is a bond, right? So just translate this data structure into that data structure. It's yeah, strange that we did this with Elm, uh, so we can get used to uh, this new language. Uh, we tried probably uh, the most obvious thing, which is a two-dimensional array, you know, and, and running it through that. Uh, when people had trouble, there was some mention of other data structures, but we didn't get very far down those lines. The interesting thing to me in the end was uh, most people blamed Elm. Oh, this problem's not well suited to Elm, or uh, things like that, you know, uh, the problem thing. So let's look at what it actually takes to solve this problem. Well, it is Ruby because we're at a Ruby meeting. Uh, so here we go. Let's do it in Ruby. And uh, we'll do a test first because that's how we do Ruby, right? That's right. So um, well, that's how you do software. That's how you do software. <laughs> Good point. Yeah, good point. Um, all right. So this is the smallest step I can think to take. And uh, that was something we had a little trouble with in the cut. I think we were trying to take two large steps at a time, and then it's easier to get lost in the weeds, right? Uh, so we just look for, see if we can get the width and height of the grid. That's code's not too tough. The size of the outer array is the width, and the size of any of the, or sorry, the height, and the size of any of the inner arrays is the width, right? Uh, then we'll take the next step. Can we get the contents of a given cell? Again, that's not very difficult. Uh, we're mainly translating X and Y in the more uh, format we're more used to seeing into the row major format of an array of arrays, right? So pretty straightforward there. All right, this is probably the biggest step. Can we get the neighbors of a cell? Can we get the contents of what's around us? There's a little bit more code here, but I think you'll be surprised it's not, it's not that complicated. We're basically iterating over the offsets, right? With negative one, negative one being our upper left corner, and one, one being our lower right corner. We add those offsets to the x, y of the cell. We make sure that's still on the board, because maybe we went off the edge. Uh, if we did, we'd get the contents of that cell. Otherwise, we throw a nil. At the end, we trim out all the nils, and that's the, the contents for our neighbors. All right, if you have the contents of your neighbors, counting bonds is actually very straightforward. You grab your neighbors and look for the x's, right? That's the count of the bonds. And if you can count the bonds in one cell, counting the bonds in all the cells is just another small step. So we produce the same data structure that we got in. If we see a bomb, we'll return a negative one. Otherwise, we use that count bombs function we've been building. And then in Ruby, we would take it one more step and just wrap it up in a top-level method that takes the whole thing in and spits the whole thing out. Uh, that's crazy straightforward just using the object that we've been building, right? So that's it. That's a solution in Ruby. But I said that we ran into problems and we, there was some discussion of, is it possible to solve it with different data structures? What do we think? Is it possible to solve it with different data structures? I see a couple of people nodding. Some people believe it's possible. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, it is actually possible, I promise. Um, if you have an array of arrays, you could flatten it down to a one-dimensional array, right? And then, assuming you knew the width, you could still look things up by x and y. You just need a little bit of math. Uh, the math is on the next to last line there. The y times the width plus x. That's how you look something up in a flattened one-dimensional array. Okay? So we can change our code to work like that. Uh, we have to grab the width and the height before we lose them from flattening. And then we have to change cell lookup to use that formula that I showed you before. Right? All other code, neighbors, bomb counting, test, etc., works no changes. Cool. That's it. This is a one-dimensional array of solution. We get it. Okay, so we have solved it with a two-dimensional array. We've solved it with a one-dimensional array. Could we solve it with something else? 
Are we done? Is this all we can do? Nah, we can do it again. How do we Right? Uh, X and Y coordinates is the keys, contents of the cell as the values. Uh, we can do this as well. So let's change the code again. Uh, this construction of the cells is a little bit more complicated. We need to map over the rows with the Y coordinate, then map over the individual cells in a row with the X coordinate, combine X and Y, and uh, the cell will put those in <coughs> subarrays. So we're going to pass an array of arrays to the hash conversion function, but the hash conversion function is really smart, and it will know that the thing in the inner arrays on the left is the key, and the thing in the inner arrays on the right is the value, and it will build the hash for us. So yay, Ruby, for being smart. Uh, once we have the hash, changing the cell lookup is ridiculously easy. We wrap X and Y in an array and pass them through, right? Again, 100% of the code that we developed before still works. Tests, neighbors, all of that. Okay. So we've solved it many different ways in Ruby, but I said we had trouble solving it in Elm. So what do you believe? Can Elm do this or not? Sure. Find it yes. partially the language has problems with data structures. Yay! <laughs> I hear somebody say that. All right, let's solve it in Elm. Um, this is Elm. I have a full test suite. It's basically a direct core to the Ruby test suite I showed you, so I'm not going to bore you with the whole thing. But it's there in the passes. Uh, I started the same way, I grabbed the width and the height and the elm, and then I moved on to getting the contents of a cell. This is a little bit harder in the elm, and the reason is that when you use the syntactical construct of a set of brackets with values in it, you get a list in the elm, not an array. And a list cannot do indexed access. In other words, we can't ask for the what's that fit item in the list. Uh, which makes sense. Lists are meant to be iterated through like in order, right? Uh, because they're linked lists. So in order to do it in Elm, I had to convert a list of lists to an array of arrays, and then I could do index access to find the cell that they need. And you can see lots of use of the pipeline operator here, the vertical bar greater than. If you were here for the talk on uh, uh, Elixir, right? Elixir has the same operator. Uh, if you don't know it, it just means Take this value, flow it into this function, whatever comes out of that function, flow it into this next line, etc. It makes these kind of nice to read uh, lines of how the data is flowing through the system. Okay, neighbors, uh, I broke up into two pieces in uh, Elm. This is the first one that uh, works over the offsets, and then it ends up calling a helper function called neighbor of, and this is neighbor of. This is a little bit complicated, and I'm not happy with it, right? <laughs> but uh, to be fair, this is on me. This is not on Elm. This is literally the first bit of Elm code I've written that is not a tutorial. So if you want to blame anybody, blame me uh, in this case. I'm sure there's better ways. Uh, but basically, it works similar to the Ruby version. I build the neighbor <coughs> coordinates. Uh, but then I had to build helpers to get the width of an array of arrays or the height of them. Then I could check to see if values were in an array. If they were, look them up. If not, I'd return nothing. It still works basically the same way as the Ruby version. It's just more code. And again, I think that's mostly my fault. Uh, after that, counting bombs is pretty much as straightforward as it is in Ruby. Grab neighbors, look the indexes, right? And the last step of converting the entire thing is, again, very similar to Ruby. Copy the data structure, throw negative ones, and we see bonds and uh, count bonds otherwise. So that's it. That's uh, all the different solutions we've seen to this one copy, right? Okay, so uh, you're probably a little shell shocked. I just threw a massive <laughs> amount of code at you. Sorry about that. Um, uh, the code is all online if you want to read it. Uh, Gen 2 is me, and uh, it's in my mind, Sweeper Kai repo. So you can go look at it, play with it solving your own pet language or with your own pet data structure. But actually, this isn't about the code. I hope you got it. Um, the, the, what it's actually about, it's about these traps we fall into, right? Oh, it's Elm that's failing us. Oh, it's because Elm can't handle two-dimensional arrays, right? Do you guys know what Turing completeness is? OK, so any language you use that's Turing complete can solve this problem. Because we've proven that Ruby can solve this problem, and Elm can solve this problem, and they're Turing complete. So if you can use any other Turing complete language, I guarantee you it can solve this problem. Right? It's not even a given, but we jump to that conclusion like right off the bat. 
oh, Elm let me down, <laughs> right? So if you can get past those blocks that, that you have, that, that thinking that stops you, then you're capable of a lot more things, right? You, we solved it with the two-dimensional array, we solved it with all these alternate data structures. Are you kind of surprised at how little the code changed when we solved it with other data structures? I didn't do that on purpose. I solved the two-dimensional one, and then I was like, all right, let's see what it takes to do it as something else. I was like, oh, I only have to change two methods. Okay, we're done. And it's a small step to those solutions once you believe they're possible, right? So in closing, I just want to leave you some great <laughs> advice. This will help you both in programming and in your relationships. So there you go. <laughs> <laughs> All right, that's it. I'm done. Thank you very much. <laughs>